I've been getting really into Fallout 4 lately, and mind you, I've only progressed through maybe 30% of the actual story as I've become quite preoccupied by building the ideal settlement for me and my new best friend, John Hancock. Also, here's a clip of Jack Cabot being slide tackled by a raider. Anyway, there's no more jarring tonal shift I've experienced in my time than watching a character I've grown to love after spending days with him breathe his last breaths as he looks on at the rising sun. There are tears streaming down my face. I'm a shell of who I was when I once started this game. And now I am being scolded by my wife and I have to drive my unhappy family to the store. Is that it with you? Tahiti or killing? Come on, John! Please, try! Try what? Welcome to Divorced Ranch Hand Simulator, host to some of the least engaging gameplay and my favorite character development moments from one of my favorite characters, John Marston. In an attempt to keep this video from being... excessively long, and with its recent buzz in the news, I assume a lot of people are maybe finding their way around to Red Dead Redemption 1 for the first time, so I will only allude to it vaguely as to not spoil anything if you've somehow managed to avoid it all these years. What I will say is that there's a version of John Marston that we see immediately in this game that is distinctly different from the man that we start the Red Dead Redemption 2 epilogue as. To his credit, he's also not the same man that he started Chapter 1 as either. There's a distinct contrast between his priorities, and there are major plot points along the way that motivate John to be loyal to what matters over the ideals of Dutch. Jack being kidnapped, being seemingly abandoned during the Lemoyne National Bank robbery, Dutch's reluctance to break him out of prison, being abandoned during yet another robbery, and yet all of this and another several years in between Arthur's passing and arriving in Strawberry, and it's clear that John still has some development left. The epilogue, then, is fundamental for laying the ground for who John is inevitably supposed to become. This is where he lays an outlaw to rest, where his redemption arguably truly starts. John is in a limbo state, a gangless outlaw, so to speak, do I think this is how John would describe himself? No. But he acts much to the effect, and we know that his family takes issue with this. We brought that trouble on ourselves. By we, you mean me. The one me who went and shot him. Seemed like he deserved shooting. I'm sure he did. But I've been thinking, ain't it about time you stop being the man making them decisions? I'm trying. This is a life that John has been living since he was a child, not even double digits old when he had become orphaned and then caught his first body by age 11. It's not so easy to just put these instincts down after two decades, and then some. Evidently, as it's been several years later and John is being berated by his wife for killing someone in Roanoke Ridge, he will later claim that this man was trying to rob him, however, we are establishing that this is cyclical behavior for John. And this is preventing him and his family from establishing a stable, sustainable lifestyle. I don't know if you guys remember being 12. Maybe some of you are 12. If so... Anyway, being 12 is kind of stressful, like your body's getting all wacky and your brain is getting all weird and you kind of hate your parents now and everything sucks and you mostly just kind of want to play like Fortnite or Roblox, but now your dad needs you to come hold the flashlight while he fixes the sink, and now he's yelling at you. And now imagine your dad refuses to acknowledge you for four years, abandons you for one of them, and then when you finally get kidnapped as ransom, he decides to take responsibility for you. But then he proceeds to fail to provide any form of stable lifestyle for you for the next eight years, and has the audacity to talk about you like this. I'll take the boy with me. He's getting soft. This kid has had his life uprooted due to decisions that his father has made, and whether or not those decisions are justified is likely not something Jack is considering. You know who probably does consider it, though? His wife! <laughs> Abigail, interestingly, has a similar background as an orphan living in less than ideal circumstances during her formative years, only to fall in with the Vanderlyn gang. She was known as a good thief, and also domed that idiot Milton in the noggin. Now admittedly, it's very cool to have your alias be the name of the man your wife shot in the head that you happen to share initials with. But is it smart? John, Jim, Milton, Marston. John Marston. It's a long story. Okay, John Marston. Marston... Unfortunately, it also doesn't help that instead of working at the general store in Strawberry, John is confronted with a slightly better opportunity to have stable work at the ranch working as a ranch hand. However, he manages to get this job opportunity by throwing his weight around. Yeah, makes me wonder just who would have robbed you. But we'll give you a chance. No doubt an honorable decision. So why is it that Abigail isn't really thrilled to hear about this? 
Could it maybe have something to do with... We gotta live somewhere for more than just a few weeks. I'm tired of fleeing, John. Every place we've been, it's been the same. We start doing okay and then boom. You act like the big man with the gun. I imagine it to be rather frustrating to live several years of your life fleeing because one half of your domestic partnership cannot stop taking the law into his own hands, as any good outlaw would. However, Abigail is no longer that concerned with the moral obligation that John seems to have where others are concerned. She's tired of running, and she would like for her family's well-being to be a priority to John. I feel that John's journal is a really helpful resource when it comes to trying to understand his priorities, his intentions, and his mindset. So let's snoop through John's journal. What I gather from a once-over is that John's sad. Anyway, remember earlier when I mentioned John killing that guy up in Roanoke Ridge? Interestingly, despite what he says, his journal seems to tell a different story. Killed a fellow because he looked at me funny. Abigail wants me to settle down. To what? Everything I've tried has gone wrong for so long now, and I'm back in old country. Well, I guess the North didn't turn out so good. He also talks about receiving his job at Pronghorn Ranch, writing, I'm not much of a rancher, but I can still give a big mouth a good smack. John's reflex is to handle situations with violence. He doesn't attempt to talk or reason, he just fights and shoots, because it's all he's known. And to put it plainly, he's good at it. John, like many of us, wants to be able to take pride in his work. I'm gonna go see what kind of good, honest work I can find. Grave digging or polishing some rich fella's boots or some such. Okay, Jack, let's just try and take some pride in this work. Simply put, he feels more like a man when he's handing out beatings than he does milking cows and shoveling sh which I think is a mindset I can understand. I can empathize with John's struggle to see clearly how his actions have an impact that's more complicated than just saving the ranch. Saving the ranch also means that there's a ranch hand in Big Valley with the initials JM that is rather capable with a gun and matches the description of an infamous outlaw that the Pinkerton Detective Agency, now the Bureau of Investigations maybe, has been on the pursuit of for the past decade or so. Jim, stop. If you're the JM I know, stop. It's Sadie Adler. Mr. Marston. Marston. Only folk around here call me Milton. It's kind of a joke, I guess. Huh. John is inarguably doing a poor job of hiding, which means that the need to move feels rather imminent to those around him. This could be why, when he runs off to kill a bunch of gang members on behalf of David Geddes, his family responds this way, instead of heralding him like a hero. John is shot and killed for a lot worse, and while I, and probably you, certainly don't feel bad for decimating the entire Laramie gang, it's not really about feeling bad anymore, is it? John is being confronted with a choice. He has to decide who he wants to be and what kind of life he wants to lead. Look, just do one thing or another. Not be two people at once. Did the man in Roanoke Ridge deserve to be shot? Maybe so, but was it worth putting Jack in harm's way and having to kill in front of him? Was it worth the final nail in the metaphorical coffin? You don't know what you have until it's gone, and I suppose John learns this the hard way. But I think it's his first real wake-up call to realizing that death is not the only thing that can take those he loves from him. His choices can too. Will he live a life where he continues to live by the ideals of Dutch years later, even after he's abandoned him not once, but like three whole times? Or is he gonna put down the games and be loyal to what matters? Interestingly, right after Abigail leaves him, we're shown that John works diligently for months as a ranch hand. Not a hired gun, not security, a ranch hand. He manages to put down the games and work hard, and it pays off when David Geddes agrees to put in a word at the bank on his behalf. At the forefront of this duology are themes of redemption, but they're bolstered by the consequences of characters' actions. Arthur finds redemption in his consequence, and now it's John's turn. These characters are often unwilling to change and are comfortable in their unhappy cycles of violence until it becomes disrupted, until there's a diagnosis, until you're forced to tell every person you interact with for the next, like, half year that your wife left you. Where's the wife, Milton? Um, uh, she's out. I saw her leaving with the boy. <laughs> you mean she left you? Oh, I never thought she was a smart woman, but, you know, this makes me think maybe I was wrong. Abigail's still alive, too, only she left me. Uh, Abigail ain't come there just yet. Really? You, er, want to talk about it? And then worse yet, none of your friends are even surprised when you tell them. John's redemption arc must first start with humbling himself. Abigail makes comments about John's pride, and of course, he denies it. What happened the other night? 
with those men. Did you kill them? I did what I had to do. To protect you. Ma said it was pride or something? Well, Ma was wrong about that. But we've already discussed that John does have pride. It begs the question, if not pride, then what is really at stake for John? When John arrives at Pronghorn Ranch, what is at stake when the Laramies want to run off with the wagon? What would happen if John didn't have the capabilities he does have? I think while playing this game, it can be easy to forget that there were general practices during the time as far as theft went, and while some people certainly did personally shoot people for thieving, it wasn't the socially supported and proposed way of handling crime. No, no, that's the law's job, of course. Anyway, the point is that any other regular person would have to report that crime to someone and hope it works out or just make peace with the loss. Is that fair? No. But that's the reality even now for, like, pro probably almost all of us. And it was the reality that Abigail wanted because it's the one that would allow them to stay there. Stay where she just got a job and where John was even offered work at the Strawberry General store. But the shopkeeper makes comments about his age and knock to his pride. But, uh... You're a bit old to be stacking groceries and running errands, ain't you, son? And then he stops a robbery, not because he has to, but because he can. And then everyone at Pronghorn Ranch can't stop gassing this dude up. Is it true what they said about you when you arrived? It, that you ran off those hired guns? Well, I heard you had some trouble with your welcome, but you kept your nerve and protected my property. No, it was nothing, sir. I feel a whole heap better having a ranch hen like you around. That is for sure. What is at stake for John if Pronghorn Ranch is assaulted in the night and he doesn't go retrieve the cattle? A job, not a scarce resource. Maybe it's that he doesn't want to have to go back to the shopkeeper and ask for another opportunity. He doesn't want to have to keep asking to be degraded and underpaid, which is a stance I can understand. However, with the choices he's made in the past, it's not as though he's really afforded the luxury of choice anymore. He's not just any man. He's a wanted man. I got a goddamn price on my head, woman! I know! I know all about that! So then maybe it's his family that's at stake. Though, his guns are in a trunk under his bed, and he could probably defend his family just fine, if not better, from the cabin. So then maybe there's something larger at play for John here. Imagine you're you're frustrated with your lot in life, you're married to a shoveling farmhand. <laughs> <laughs> you know that woman of yours got the look of a woman ain't had a real ride in her life. She's gotta make do with some piss poor stinking farmhand. Hey, hey, tell her I'll let her in my sheets. As long as she bathes first in sheep dip, get the stink of you off of her, farmhand! I don't think Abigail is missing the mark here. Sure, John may feel some moral obligation to help Pronghorn Ranch. He states that he likes David Geddes, and I can see why with the way he treats John. I don't care what you used to do or what your, your, your name is. This is the land of second chances. It also feels right to blast that dude for talking poorly about Abigail. But John's actions, past and present, have consequences. Consequences like sometimes having to take some things on the chin, because there's more at stake than a wagon. There's more at stake than a job. This is what Abigail is begging John to understand, and this is what Abigail means when she talks about pride. This is why the next period of John's life is spent humbling himself, shoveling shit, asking for and accepting help, literally putting himself into debt to build a ranch from scratch to make an honest attempt at showing Abigail that he hurt her. The times now that John is doing murder seem to be primarily in self-defense as it's not the man he tries to be anymore. I don't want to get in a shootout over this. That's not the man I try to be anymore. It's not his fault that he moved next door to an aggressive transient gang that he is not actively picking a fight with. And he doesn't pay for it either. He also does some light bounty hunting until Sadie puts him out to pasture, but even then if you shoot Shane Finley during an honest day's labor, John gets quite introspective about it in one of my favorite dialogue exchanges maybe in the game. The truth is, I might be more cut out for this work than ranching. Or having a family. Maybe killing's all I'm good for, too. I'd actually miss this back and forth for a while because I like hitting the guy when Sadie tells me to. The point I'm illustrating here is that it's clear that a shift in John's priorities is happening. Responding with violence when it's not absolutely necessary seems to weigh on John in a way that it hadn't before. He sees the consequences of these things. He's living in them. However, there's a brief reprieve to living with the consequences as John gets to reap the reward of this hard work and dedication and his family returns to him and this new ranch he's built them. John, of course, wants to feel good about the work he's done and wants to know that he's done something right for once, so he asks for reassurance. So you happy? I think so. 
And I did good? You did good. Sadie's here. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> this is where another major concern of Abigail's becomes very apparent. I was thinking maybe if John wanted to earn some money. My husband, he ain't looking for that kind of work. I took on a lot of debt when we bought this place. And you're working for her to pay it off? I'm sorry, Abigail. Really, I am. I just thought if you wanted to earn some money. How many times do I gotta bury you, John Marston? There was a point where Abigail had lived a brief period of time believing that John had died. He abandoned her with his child for a year. She had lived a time where his life was under imminent threat and she had to beg others to intervene and save his life. Her desire is not only to live a stable life, but to live a stable life with John. I can't really blame her for taking issue with the ideas of taking down Micah or bounty hunting even after the legality of it has been cleared up for her. Also, legality aside, Sadie is living proof that the bounty hunting industry is quite literally cutthroat. You make enemies who want you dead. The profession doesn't exactly scream safe and stable. Though, once John gets through his rather reasonable responses, like needing money to pay off the major debt they've taken on in building the ranch, it comes back to this. But I thought we said no more of that. No, you said that. What else am I gonna do? I'm a goddamn man! It's John wants to feel like a man, and I guess if there's one last thing that's going to give him a shake to make him reconsider his priorities, it might be nearly dying to a bear. John, hold on! Hold on! Maybe it wasn't right of me to bring you along on those really heavy things. A family man and all. I'm my own man, ain't I? I get to make those calls. I needed the money. I don't know if your ranch and your kid and your wife are things I want to be worrying about when I hear a gunshot. <sighs> yeah. Having it put into words like this from Sadie probably had John reconsidering this line of work altogether, especially after he had just told her he wants to propose to Abigail. He can't have it both ways anymore, and it's not as though he doesn't have means of making money. He has a literal ranch. It might just be a little slower and more painstaking to make back the money to pay it off, but at least his wife won't have to worry about him being shot at work. It feels like things have paid off a little, and the interactions from here on out are largely really warm. John has a ranch and his family back, and he plans to propose. But first, John must overcome his last obstacle. Fatherhood. John has a rather clueless approach to fatherhood, and it's hard to expect much more when any paternal presence in his life could be described as... less than stellar. His fishing trip with Jack is a pleasant contrast both to Jack's first fishing trip with Arthur, as he now has the patience to stick it out and manages to catch something, but also it's a pleasant contrast to the dynamic that Jack and John had in the first part of the epilogue where their guards were up and they couldn't connect with each other. Take him out, please. Come on, boy. Let's go for a walk. Come on, getting on, son. Uh, fine, sir. What are you doing? Reading and, uh, playing with the dog. You wanna go fishing or something? What I appreciate is that when John humbles himself and admits to Jack that he's inexperienced and really just trying his best, it works and there's a distinct shift in their dynamic. They both drop the defensive tones and manage to warm up. I'm not very good at this. At fishing or walking? At talking with you. It's fine being out with you even though I can't say the right thing. And you, Pop. John proposing to Abigail feels indicative of a priority shift. I say this because it came from John's own personal desires, not Abigail's. It's something I've thought about, and I, I think, I know, I want it. Will you marry me? Get up, I am married to you. No, I mean, proper. Abigail doesn't even see it coming and laughs it off initially. To her, they were already married. She was Abigail Marston without all the song and dance. Abigail Roberts- Marston! Abigail Marston, Miss Marston to you. But this mattered to John. This was a priority to John. I didn't know it mattered to me. It didn't. But now it does. This alone feels like redemption to me. It feels like the outlaw might finally be laid to rest. Gone is the man who shoots people for looking at him funny and can't get his priorities straight. No, this is a John Marston who wants to take portraits with his wife and then take her to a moving picture show. It's the marvel of the age. I love marvels. 
and then to take her out on a boat to propose to her at the sunset. If only this could be where we leave John's story. But alas, those lingering memories from his past life must be put to rest. And he starts with Micah Bell. Abigail begs and she pleads, but John continues to say that this is something he has to do. For those that fell, but most importantly for Arthur. I'm begging you. No! You risk all this? For what? For Micah? All this? All this wouldn't exist if it weren't for Arthur, Sadie, and all the folks that fell. What's frustrating is they're both right. They wouldn't have any of this if it wasn't for Arthur and the rest, but I can't necessarily blame Abigail for only seeing the risk in it. They've built so much, and Abigail sees the future while John sees the past, and I can see both of their perspectives. And from a player's perspective, I want revenge for Arthur, too. We owe this to Arthur. You think Arthur cared about revenge? I'm not so sure, especially not at the end. My thinking is it never mattered to Arthur. In fact, I think Arthur is rolling in his grave watching John get revenge on his behalf. Like he always said. Revenge is a luxury we can't afford. Vengeance is an idiot's game. Soon, you gotta go. Go. Don't look back. Unfortunately, there's still more for John to learn on his path to redemption about consequences and complex morality. But in the meantime, he has some time to bask in his new domestic lifestyle, get good at ranching, do some book learning, you know. Though in the interest of time and spoilers, I'm gonna leave it there as a nice little epilogue... synopsis. Anyway, I was genuinely really blown away and overwhelmed by the response to my last and also first upload. I was not anticipating that response at all, so thank you. It's very motivating in the realm of continuing to make content like this, so anyway, that's it. Bye.